Figlin, the Steven Spielberg Family Chair in Hematology Oncology at Cedar sinai Cancer in Los Angeles. And I'm delighted today to be joined for the Kidney Cancer Journal uh, webinar by Arlene Seifert Ratke, who's a professor of general urinary medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And she specializes in effective therapies in the treatment of urothelial cancer and rare tumors. And Dr. Nizar Tanir, a longtime friend of mine, who's a professor in the Department of General Urinary Medical Oncology at MD Anderson, and holds the endowed Ransom Horn Jr. Professorship in Cancer Research, and has received many awards, the most recent of which the John Mendelssohn Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021. So Arlene and Nizar, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Bob, for the yeah. opportunity. Thank you so much for having us. So I, I, this is a really exciting topic uh, for today, and we'll, we'll do this in a, a very transparent way. So um, a, as you know, and I'll, I'll address the first question to you, Arlene, um, we have a long-standing interest in, in kidney cancer in interleukin-2. And just to put that in perspective and not to age myself, but in 1990 and 1992, I visited the FDA to review the first and second submissions for interleukin-2 now almost 30 years ago. So, and what we know about interleukin-2 is that it was incredibly difficult to deliver, but incredibly effective for a small subset of patients, producing durable and maintained remissions, which we consider to be cures. And, and it was for that reason that it was approved, and then it's been used moderately uh, by selected physicians over the last several decades. We and others have tried to find biomarkers for activity to predict who would benefit, and we're really unsuccessful in that regard, and are really very excited when we started to learn that there might be a next generation interleukin-2 to start to ask and answer questions about that. So Arlene, the first question is really, how does pegylation affect IL-2's pharmacology, and how does BEMPEG differ in its pharmacologic activities than the more traditional interleukin-2 that we've been using for decades? So those are great questions because BEMPEG aldous leukin is not our daddy's IL-2. It's clearly different in its toxicity and clinical activity. IL-2 being a cytokine really has PKs that aren't durable in the circulation. So when you administer intravenously, we see that it's taken up very quickly. And at the doses that were given back in the day when IL-2 reigned as king for the treatment of renal cell carcinoma, we did see that excessive toxicity, a profound hypotension, um, you know, cytokine type syndromes, diffuse edema, and frequent transfers to the intensive care unit, which resulted in IL-2 being limited to a young, healthier patient population. With the pegylations that are given to IL-2, what happens is that there's six pegylations added to IL-2. And as a result of these pegylations, the infusion of IL-2, even though it's given over a short interval, it now remains in the circulation for a longer period of time. In fact, the PK suggests that it remains in the circulation for up to about a week. So what is happening is we're seeing prolonged stimulation of the lymphocytes that we would like to generate in order to enhance an immune response. And when we look at the PKs of this drug and when we look at the lymphocytes, we do see that increase in lymphocytes and the circulation and in patients' tumors translating to that pharmacodynamic effect that we hope to achieve with this improved pharmacokinetics. So that that's obviously takes me to the next question, Arlene. That's just a wonderful summary. And, and that is, how does the toxicity profile of the pegylated molecule change how the patient receives it, how we deliver it, and what the expected therapeutic index will be? Mm -hmm. 
So once it is given in the circulation, slowly those pegylations are removed, which is resulting in its clinical activity. Rather than getting that profound surge in cytokines that we saw in the era of high-dose IL-2, we see this more prolonged but sustained effect stimulating IL-2 via the circulation. So when you think of cytokines, those are very short acting, often very localized. Now we can give a systemic cytokine in a more safe fashion, resulting in less profound hypotension. Although hypotension is still an issue, but usually if that happens, it happens within the first three days of the infusion and is frequently managed by increased oral hydration. And we rarely have actually I haven't had to admit anyone to the hospital for the hypotension. So now we have a therapy that can be administered as an outpatient and doesn't cause those profound toxicity due to the very high dose cytokines that have effects up front. We, we see that prolonged modulation. So that, that's a profound difference to the more traditional IL-2. I mean, just the idea that this is an outpatiently, outpatient delivered therapy doesn't require hospitalization and intensive care unit support is a major difference than the, than the historic interleukin-2 that we've given. So, so Dr. Tanir, let, let's turn our attention to you. Um, clearly, uh, when, when one thinks about interleukin-2 in 2022, what comes to mind is these durable remissions. And, and one of the markers of activity of BenPEG is going to be, does it have the same ability to produce these deep, important clinical remissions for patients with kidney cancer that can really affect their clinical activity when administered alone, or as we talk about in a few minutes, when delivered in combination. So what's, what's the, what, what are the responses that you have seen and have been reported with this molecule? Well, I, uh, thank you, Bob, for the question. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Arlene on her uh, excellent summary of the MOA of, of uh, BAMPAC. But I'd like to add also that I think we can think of the differential between BAMPAC and the uh, native high dose IL-2 that you and uh, your colleagues pioneered uh, several decades ago uh, is that BAMPAC is a preferential uh, signaler through the uh, beta-gamma uh, subunits or dimeric beta-gamma of the IL-2 receptor rather than the alpha. Uh, and rather than uh, signaling through the uh, trimeric alpha uh, and, and beta gamma. So it is, it is that CD122 agonism that really differentiates it uh, from high dose IL-2. Back to your question about, you know, uh, the, the, the landscape, as you well know, in RCC and in melanoma and urothelial and others has expanded with the uh, advent of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what can BAMPAG add to this competitive landscape is that we hope that uh, similar to the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we will have sustained responses. And if you look at now the uh, PIVOT02 uh, data, which is uh, you know phase one and phase two data in solid tumors uh, that Arena and I uh, participated in, and our colleague at MD Anson in the melanoma department, Dr. Adi Diab, also uh, participated in, in the melanoma department. When you look at that data, what you see is, as Arlene mentioned, you know, every cycle you give of BEMPAG, uh, you, you see that lymphocytosis in the peripheral blood, and you see a sawtooth uh, appearance with each sustained, uh, with each cycle, you see a sustained lymphocytosis. But again, more importantly, or as importantly, is you see also recruitment increase in the T cell infiltration in tumors. And as you well know, you know, this is uh, important if we're going to have a sustained response uh, of solid tumors uh, to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Those, page, those tumors have to be inflamed. We have to recruit T cells. And so what does BEMPAC do? BEMPAC does increase the infiltration of lymphocytes into the tumors. It increases their proliferation and activation with increase in the PD-1 expression on, on the T-cell cells. And obviously we know that 
the uh, target of the immune checkpoint, particularly an anti-PD-1 antibody, the target is the PD-1. And uh, what BEMPAC does in combination with an agent such as nivolumab is it increases not only the infiltration and proliferation and activation of these cells, but it increases the PD-1 expression on these T cells. And so we hope that with this dual uh, mechanism of, you know, on one hand, you have the PD-1 antibody or the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which is which acts as a releasing the brakes on the immune cells to, to go against the cancer cells. And, you know, the BEMPAC is the one that puts the gas on the pedal. So, um, so we hope that this is the ideal combination. So just to give you a, a, an example of the efficacy uh, of, of this combination of BEMPAC plus nivolumab in solid tumors, uh, I would uh, like to cite a recently published uh, manuscript from uh, led by our uh, group here, Dr. Adi Dia, uh, on the melanoma cohort, where it was published in JCO, and it was one of the most downloaded, actually, manuscript of 2021, where in 38 patients with metastatic melanoma, first-line therapy in 38 patients with BEMPAC plus nivolumab produced an impressive 34% CR rate and 53% overall response rate, with a median progression-free survival in these patients of 30.9 months, compared to what historically a single-agent PD-1 antibody produced in melanoma, CR rate is 14%, and the median PFS is around uh, six, seven months. Even with nivolumab, the median PFS is around 11 months. So this is data that's published that I can share with you and your audience uh, uh, about the effect of uh, BEMPAC plus nivolumab in melanoma. Uh, in bladder, uh, Arlene can speak about the uh, cohort or the trial that she led within that pivot 2 trial in urothelial carcinoma. She presented some of this data, I believe, two years ago at ASCO-GU. Uh, I can speak to the uh, about the RCC cohort and it may be a future uh, you know, webinar or, or an interview, uh, a roundtable discussion like this one, once we have our two manuscripts uh, uh, published. Right now, I think uh, the, the data is confidential about the RCC uh, cohort um, uh, from that Pivot02 trial. So Arlene, let's, let's turn to you. Let's expand on the phase one experience. Tell us a little bit about what your experience is, both in the GU space, as well as the the toxicity profile of the combination, and obviously share with us only things that are not, not, not uh, privileged. Mm -hmm. But but clearly the JCO article excited everyone into thinking about a combination trial. And 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 everybody knows in oncology these days, one of the things that we try and do is turn cold tumors hot, and 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 whether BEMPEG actually can start to incite with activation of PD1 inside the tumor recruitment of lymphocytes and, and then adding a checkpoint inhibitor makes that activity greater. So what was your experience with the phase one and, and also share your experience with your ethereal tumors? So in our experience in the phase one and, and including your ethereal tumors, we saw exactly what you mentioned, Robert. We we see these cold tumors, PDL1 low tumors and CD8 low tumors. So these are the tumors that traditionally haven't responded to immunotherapy in the setting of your ethelial carcinoma. And we saw that with treatment with BEMPEG and NEVO, that we were able to convert these tumors to a pdl one positive phenotype with higher CD8 positive T cells. So again, the lymphocytes that we are hoping to generate to induce the immune response. As Nazar mentioned, we, we see such lymphocyte proliferation. I have had patients where the tumors have tripled to even quadrupled in size. And at their first restaging, you'd think this patient is certainly must be progressing. But then when you meet with the patient, they say, well, I'm, I'm surprised by the CT report. I actually feel better. My pain has improved. And I have one such patient whose tumor did 
quadruple in size. It was a mass near the pelvic sidewall. And with continuation of treatment, we saw reduction in that mass over time, where we saw that mass have the, probably at least an 80% reduction or greater for the long term. So again, that pharmacodynamic effect where we're stimulating lymphocytes, we are getting them to go to the tumors where they need to be. We're converting the tumor microenvironment from that PDL1 low to PD8 or PDL1 high. We're seeing it go from CD8 T cell low to CD8 T cell high. So again, all the features that we hope to invoke for an immune response. And when we look at the early clinical data in the setting of bladder cancer, we saw in patients who received treatment, we saw a response rate over 40% objective response rate. And this was despite this being very early data without as much follow-up. So a nice early response rate. We also saw evidence that some of these responses are appearing to be potentially durable, like we're seeing in the melanoma group, where they have 80% of patients who responded haven't yet progressed. And that's at a median melanoma follow-up of 29 months. So the hope is that these treatments will work in that PDL1 low group, that CD8 T cell low group, where we've seen a lack of efficacy with immunotherapy. We've also seen activity in patients with visceral metastases, which is very important in urothelial cancer, where the response rates with liver metastases and visceral mets appear lower compared to the node-only group of patients. And yet, with Bempeg, Aldizlucan, and nivolumab given together, we're seeing similar response rates in both visceral and non-visceral metastases. So our hope is this will overcome the limitation of immunologically cold tumors. It may help drive responses, especially combined with other features associated with a cold tumor microenvironment and even enhance the activity of TKIs that may be used in a colder immune tumor environment. So Arlene, let's, let's extend your experience and let's talk about what, what practicing physicians are always going to be worried about, and that's immune-related adverse events. So, I mean, we know we, we have the history of interleukin-2, we have the history of IOs, and now we combine them. And, and are we seeing some of the uh, endocrine abnormalities associated with immune-related uh, treatments, or are you seeing anything unusual, or it's pretty much the expected toxicities associated with checkpoint inhibitors? At this time, it does appear to be the expected and anticipated toxicity profile that we're observing with single-agent immunotherapy and combination immunotherapy strategies. I do have a sense that the hypothyroidism does tend to come on a little faster um, in patients receiving this combination, which could be a result of, you know, we're just fueling the fire, driving a better and faster immune response so patients do he head toward that hypothyroid state a little quicker. We've seen a little more, perhaps a little more hypoadrenal um, or um, low cortisol levels, hypoadrenal state. But again, you can give replacement therapy for that. So at the moment, it appears very similar to what's been observed with immune checkpoint inhibitors with a similar profile. The biggest difference is we do see some of those IL-2 effects, but it's not as profound. We see hypotension that's controlled with fluids, fever and myalgias, usually controlled with Tylenol. And most patients report these types of symptoms lasting a few days up to a week at most. And then as they continue on treatment, the effects do seem to be a bit abrogated. So they do tend to improve over time. And, and obviously, when we think about combinations like Ipinevo, where it's both checkpoint and CTLA-4 blockade, there's a high frequency of the need of steroids. Mm -hmm. Has steroid use been frequent or infrequent in the, in the patients receiving the combination of Benpeg and Nevo? 
I would say it's similar, um, at least based on my experience. It, it really depends on that frequency of the immune-mediated events that require steroids, the pneumonitis, colitis, and myositis. So like anything that stimulates the immune response, these toxicities can occur and in my experience, it has been a fairly similar use of steroids across both the Bempeg Aldous Luke and Nevo cohort and patients who we've treated on single agent immunotherapy. There's even been some debate, even with Nevo Ipi in bladder, we haven't seen a substantial increase in toxicity. And, you know, how much of that is based on experience? You know, we've gotten better at recognizing these toxicities earlier and treating them more effectively earlier. But overall, I would say it's similar to what we've account encountered already with other immune checkpoint inhibitors. That's great. So, so Nizar, let, let's turn our attention to the Pivot09 study, which is really the randomized trial. So you're an expert in kidney cancer. You've been doing this work for, for years now. And, and that trial is basically going to be a combination trial compared to a TKI. So help, help us understand, you know, what your thoughts are around the design of the trial, the readouts of the primary and secondary endpoints, and what you're hoping to obtain uh, with this uh, with this prospective phase three trial? Yeah, thank you, Bob, for the question. I mean, when we uh, designed this trial, you know, now this is 2018, four years ago. Uh, obviously, we were aware of the landscape had uh, quickly changed with the approval of uh, several of the uh, immune uh, checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Uh, regimens and so obviously nivolumab epilimumab was approved uh, for patients with intermediate risk poor risk and then uh, you know following that uh, you know the uh, three IOTKI regimens as you well aware of uh, so we really uh, struggled with the design would we choose for a comparator as you mentioned a single agent TK TKI so in many, uh, obviously, when uh, you know we were thinking of uh, designing this trial and making a registrational trial, a phase three trial, uh, we wanted to make this a, an international, a global uh, trial. And many of the countries uh, outside the US and uh, maybe some of the European countries, uh, these regimens, the EVO-IPI and uh, the IOTKIs, Pembroaxi and the and nevo Cabo and the others, were not approved. And in some countries, actually, they're still not approved. So we really wanted to uh, make this a uh, uh, global uh, trial. And uh, a single agent TKI was approved in many of the countries who, uh, that participated. So we uh, chose uh, sunitinib. We made it a uh, investigator or a dealer's choice, as they say, between a sunitinib or a cabuzantinib in some of the countries. Cabuzantinib, like in the US, was an approved age TKI as single agent. And so we, uh, so obviously the phase three was uh, basically a randomized uh, two arm study of the combination of BEMPAC plus NEVO versus uh, Sunintinib, uh, where Sunintinib is approved in the countries uh, where it's approved as, uh, as first line and in countries where Cabuzantinib is approved, Cabuzantinib. And the two uh, co-primary endpoints uh, we selected for this were uh, objective response rate and OS. And the, the good news is the trial did uh, reach, despite the pandemic, the global pandemic, uh, we were able to enroll upward of 600 patients uh, on this uh, international trial. Uh, and we uh, you know, uh, recruited the last patient uh, over a year ago. So we hope that this trial will um, read out this year. Um, we hope that uh, the uh, combination will uh, show the uh, activity and the uh, uh, promising results that we saw from the uh, single arm study of Pivot02 with uh, Bempac Nivolumab. So um, I think just wanted to add why is, in my opinion, uh, and for a an investigator such as yourself, who uh, you know built a career about uh, high dose IL-2, why would this 
Ben Pagni will be, uh, a, you know, a promising, exciting, uh, maybe an alternative uh, uh, in some risk groups, for example, of RCC. Again, it's because the toxicity profile is so favorable. Um, and I'd like to really expand on what Arlene mentioned. You brought up this the corticosteroids. If you look at the Checkmate 214 study, uh, the percentage of patients who required high dose corticosteroids was 35%. So, and the discontinuation rate because of, of immune mediated adverse events was 22%. So in our experience from, you know, leading several of these pivot trials, we see that the discontinuation rate because of AEs is very low. And I would like to uh, contrast my experience in RCC. I, that's what I see. And Arlene obviously spoke about her experience in patients with bladder cancer. In my experience with uh, RCC, the actual uh, utilization of high dose corticosteroids with the combination of Bampac nivolumab was really low. And we saw really low uh, discontinuation rate because of IMAEs. So in my experience, in my opinion, I think the Bampac nivolumab does bring an advantage over the other IO-based regimens in that uh, there is less discontinuation rate, there is less utilization of corticosteroids, and we have not seen an increase in IMAEs, at least in the RCC patient population, over a single agent anti-PD-1. And certainly we see that there is definite decrease, uh, lower uh, rates of uh, discontinuation and IMAEs compared to nivo -EP. So if we can achieve with BEMPAC NIVO the same efficacy that we achieve with, with uh, say, the IO-based regimens with IOTKI or nivo -EPI, but with lower rates of discontinuation and adverse events, I think we would really have brought to the, uh, to the clinic and to patients a really promising, effective therapy that uh, we all look forward to really uh, uh, prescribe to our patients. So Arlene, I, wa I want to circle back um, to your, your comments about the phase one trial. And, and the reason I want to do that is because I'm intrigued by the, the conversation that we're having about co turning cold tumors hot. And, and, and clearly one of the ways that we would demonstrate that would be in the second or third line setting where a person has received prior IO therapy and then gets the combination, and now all of a sudden they benefit. Were there any? Was there anyone in the in the phase one trial that had received prior immune therapy that then benefited from the combination with Benpeg? So unfortunately, that was not studied as part of our PIVOT-02 and, and in GU tumors. So though you raise a great question, could it take some tumors where a patient hadn't responded to immunotherapy and enhance the immune response? Could there be scenarios, say in a post-chemo-treated patient or a post-TKI-treated patient where the use of this combination could have clinical activity? I, I would have to say the potential is there, although it hasn't yet been explored uh, since the decision was made to try it in the upfront setting, since we saw such good early clinical activity in this group of tumors. And for the bladder cohort, given the single agent use of immunotherapy in the PDL1 high group of tumors, but the lack of utility in PDL1 low, the phase two trial in urothelial cancer focused on that frontline PDL1 low group of tumors to see if this could provide a potential benefit compared to what had been observed historically with single agent immunotherapy. So again, trying to provide an option for patients who might not be good candidates for systemic chemotherapy. But could it enhance an immune response as post-TKI in combination with the TKI? I think it's uh, very likely that it could. And I hope that some of these trials do turn positive and there's incentive to continue studying this combination further. So, so guys, let, let's, let's bring this to a close by asking each of you to kind of summarize your experience. These are, I'll turn to you first. Summarize your experience and, and then summarize for us, for the people that'll be listening and reading, 
what they should be looking for over the next one to three years as the readouts start to come from the pivotal trials. Because clearly, one of the challenges for these combinations is when oncologists hear the word interleukin-2, they sometimes get startled and wonder whether that's something that they can do. And it's important that they start to understand that bag peg, as Arlene nicely pointed out, is not 1990s interleukin-2, it's a 2022 molecule with pegylation and a different therapeutic index. So what do you, how would you summarize where the field is today and where it's going, Yuzar? And then I'll ask Arlene the same question. Yeah, thank you, Bob. So uh, Benpeg is a novel uh, agent. Uh, and uh, the uh, clearly, I'll summarize the advantages. Uh, a, uh, as I mentioned, it signals preferentially through the uh, beta, gamma, uh, dimeric, uh, you know, subunits of the interleukin receptor. So it has a 20 hour half-life rather than 20 minute half-life compared to the high dose IL-2. It can be given as an outpatient. We have not seen uh, when we gave it monotherapy and when we gave it in combination with an anti-PD-1 like nivolumab, we have not seen an increase in the immune mediated adverse events. And we've seen, uh, because we've done in the pivot 02, in the phase one during escalation and later expansion in the different solid tumors, we've seen when we did biopsies baseline prior to therapy and biopsies three weeks later. And we, when we collected blood on these patients weekly after the infusion, monotherapy and in combination, we've seen lymphocytosis as we spoke about. In the tumor microenvironment, when we did the biopsies, we saw in an expansion, an increase of infiltration of T cells. And we saw increase in the PD-1 expression on T cells. And as Arlene mentioned, in, in some tumors, in fact, in bladder, a patient with bladder cancer, there was 70% conversion of PDL1 negative to PDL1 positive tumors. So, in aggregate, all these different effects of BEMPAG are salutary and are, I, I believe, uh, a step forward to really hope to break the uh, a cure barrier. Now, what uh, can I see? What do I see in the next, uh, you know, obviously, year to three years? There are three registration trials, one in melanoma in first line, BEMPAC plus NEVO versus NEVO. Again, the trial complete accrual. We, we hope to have the read up this year. The pivot 09, as you alluded to, Bob, uh, of BEMPAC NEVO versus the TKI of choice, Sinitinib or Cabozantinib, we'll, we'll have the read up this year. And then the third, Arlene, uh, is the uh, global PR of that trial, pivot uh, 10. Uh, looking at you know uh, the the um, cis platin in Elizabeth and low PDL1 in bladder in more than 100 patients. So we'll see. We hope that uh, all three of these trials will be positive and will be able to bring uh, this combination to patients with melanoma, with uh, RCC and bladder. And where we are going forward is obviously not just uh, because, as you well know, Bob. The field is moving to triplets and, and uh, quadruplets. So we hope, and we have done already started looking at triplets of BEMPAC, NEVO plus a TKI. So there's a trial pivot 011, uh, again, partnership of BMS and uh, Nectar Therapeutics and uh, many investigators at again, academic uh, institutions where we are looking to see the, the triplet, the efficacy and safety of the triplet. And I can share with you that preliminary uh, data, uh, at least in my experience at MD Anderson, uh, having uh, uh, treated some of these patients with the triplets, that it's it's deliverable, it's safe. So we are able to give a TKI that's FDA approved uh, for RCC, like cabozantinib, plus nivolumab, plus Bempag. Obviously, we'll have to you know finish the trial and it is uh, it will be a randomized trial looking at the triplet versus doublet. So I think it's exciting time uh, for for the field of solid tumors, where you know in the past during uh, your uh, tenure uh, at UCLA, Bob, when you led many of these uh, high dose IL two trials from application or use or utilization in just two tumors, melanoma and RCC. Now we see the expansion with BEMPAG 
how in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors, plus or minus TKIs or chemotherapy or other cytokines where we are now seeing hopefully application in many solid tumors. So we're expanding the indications of, uh, you know, this novel uh, CD122 agonist to other solid tumors and not just melanoma RCC. So Arlene, uh, in your hands, great experience, in-depth understanding of the biology. Where do you hope this combination therapy is going, especially in urothelial tumors? I mean, we, we have had such challenges with urothelial tumors mm -hmm. um, for decades. And, and we've, we've always basically been, you know, platinum, platinum people yeah. trying, to, trying to find ways to take care of people that we didn't feel like we were doing the best that we could. And now all of a sudden we have immunotherapy and now we have them paid, which could add to that. So what are your hopes for the next several years for these patients with urothelial tumors, especially in your, your experience? So what I am hoping for is the ability to apply that durability that was seen very early in the high-dose IL-2 era, and now apply it to groups of patients who were never candidates or never would have been candidates for an IL-2-directed therapy. The improved toxicity profile is real. When Back when I was a resident, we gave the high-dose IL-2, and <laughs> after the infusion, we handed the nurse the patient's transfer orders for the ICU in case they would need that rapid transfer. But now we're able to give this IL-2, this new way of giving it, Benpeg Aldous Lucan, six pegylations on it. We're able to give it as an outpatient. We're able to do it safely, even in elderly, frail bladder cancer patients. I've treated several patients with Parkinson's disease, and I think anyone who's given chemotherapy to this patient population will tell you chemotherapy is bad on nerves. It worsens dementia, it worsens Parkinson's. So I think we are developing treatments that can be applied more widely into elderly, frail bladder cancer patients given as an outpatient and hopefully result in that durability of response that led us to continue high dose IL-2 20 years ago um, because of that potential for benefit. Yeah, so let, let me just say Arlene and Nizar, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to chat with you. I know that you're in Houston and I'm in Los Angeles. And, and, and just hearing you talk about a next generation of a molecule that we know had profound effects, but in a very few patients, offering patients the opportunity to go from cold tumors to hot tumors, outpatient-based therapy, no additional immune adverse events to what we would have otherwise expected with our current checkpoint inhibitors. It's a, it continues to be an exciting time. And I agree with you, Nizar. I mean, while it's in melanoma, kidney, and bladder cancer today, there's no reason to think that the portfolio of this combination couldn't be expanded to other immunologically responsive or non-responsive tumors. So that was great, guys. That's exactly what we wanted. You guys are spectacular as always. Thank you both for your time today. Please Thank be you. safe. Take Thank care. you, Bob. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Arlene. And uh, Bob, thank you again. You're uh, absolutely the best moderator uh, mm -hmm. I know of. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, this R makes it very easy. So, uh, thank you so much.